Sure. Aloha, Mike Taco. I'm Kaili Chan, and I'm so grateful to be here today with uh, Bundit and, and Richard and Kevin. Thank you so much for including me in your Crossing Boundaries um, interview uh, series. Uh, it's, um, it's sort of humbling to, to be a part of this uh, experience uh, with some, some of the noted individuals that you folks have included in the series. So um, I, I don't know if I'm worthy enough to be here, but I thank you so much for, uh, for your inclusion uh, and, and your consideration of, of my work. Um, Abundant, as, as you know, uh, my work uh, does cross boundaries to a certain degree. Uh, it, it, it integrates art and architecture. It uh, takes a look at place and culture and tradition, uh, traditional practice, uh, and it crosses into the contemporary practice as well. Uh, so you know, just a little bit of background. Uh, I was born and raised here in Hawaii on the island of Oahu. Uh, I went to school here. I'm a graduate of the Kamehameha schools. And I went away for college and got my uh, undergraduate degree in architecture from Princeton University. And then came back home eventually uh, to get a master's in fine arts. Uh, in, from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I also started uh, the DART program at, at uh, UH Manoa, but uh, I, I have since uh, halted my progress in, in that sense uh, because I've, I've gotten really, really busy um, making art and also working with uh, G70 uh, group formerly known as Group 70 uh, International, uh, which is a, an architecture firm based here in Honolulu. And um, I've been working on uh, many projects with them. So I'm quite fortunate to, to be kept busy doing that uh, with them. And also I'm a lecturer at Kipiolani Community College. Uh, and then I continue my practice as an installation artist primarily. So. Sculpture in installation is is really my genre of art, and um, you know I look to integrate uh, a spatial, I guess, uh, occupation and spatial um, formation uh, with place-based uh, research, and um, that's what you know basically I do. Some examples, uh, well, of, of my most recent work, uh, of course, beginning with the Prince Waikiki and creating work that uh, we could introduce into the space, into the main lobby space at least, um, with a suspended sculpture. So it's a multi-component uh, piece that encompasses uh, 850 uh, different hand hammered copper pieces uh, and these were done by the staff and their families of the hotel and so this was a way to I, I guess um, you know first of all crossing the boundary of what has become I think ingrained in Waikiki which is the kitschy uh, tiki culture kind of tourist based um, uh, colorful surf oriented art and uh, what we did was we really researched the site itself and uh, were able to uh, I guess join some of these these parts of history and the genealogy of the land and take from it certain elements that we could use as a foundation for creating this art, but also to involve our, our, our closest community, which was the community of the hotel staff and, and certain guests who had been, um, uh, you know, there from the get go. So 
what we really did there was reintroduce the authentic, original, ancestral history of place into this art piece uh, from which we could uh, share tidbits of, of education, tidbits of history, tidbits of culture to the people that embody and, and make this hotel what it is. Uh, you, you can have a hotel, but without its people, you have a building and that's it. And um, I think it was really important to revisit and re-examine and reintroduce that ancestral history to the people who could tell the story. So we were able to, one, now incorporate art into architecture and have that uh, be the foundational narrative uh, that the staff could then refer to. And having literally have a, had a hand in making it, it became a, a, a significant part of their own narrative. Uh, so, you know, we have this hotel here, which was previously a hospital, which was previously a Muli Wai. And, and the Muli Wai is where the fresh water enters the ocean. Now, we can no longer bring that back. But what we can do is we can bring the memory of that back so that we understand the, the true history of that land, of that place, specific to Prince Waikiki. And in, do, in so doing, uh, we cross boundaries of time, uh, of, of culture, you know, guests, uh, Malahini, Kama'aina, Native Hawaiian or Kanaka Maoli. And, 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 and in that sense, we can start to um, present a more educated, sophisticated understanding of place and locality and identity. And um, I would say, that, you know, uh, we were able to create, I would say 20 to 25 sessions uh, for the staff. And, you know, once we began these, these hand hammering sessions, because the pieces are made out of copper, uh, they then became to understand uh, where they were located and the importance of ancestral history. So, you had some staff that had been working there for 25 years and they don't even know the name, the Hawaiian name for banana. Uh, and, and, you know, that's Maia. And, and so there are little things like this that we could introduce them through this card that we developed. For them, they had uh, the entire diagram of the uh, installation and it was numbered. And we circled the number that was then uh, hammered onto the copper form and uh, they were able they are now they have that card they sign that card and they know exactly where their piece is located so they have that visual reference and on the back of that card is uh, the the Hawaiian lunar calendar or the lunar phase of that day that they hammered their their copper form and uh, we gave them a little tidbit of what was good i don't you see that on the news now but on this day it's good to plant maia or kalo or uh, other root vegetables um or go fishing or not go fishing in that sort of thing so you know in in these these are ways where art is now a, a foundational narrative for the the entire brand and the entire hotel and it also it is a talking point where the staff can visually use to, to, to continue to tell that story. So the history continues as well as um, the recognition of, of, of that genealogy of land. So, and you know, in, in terms of, um, I also want to uh, speak a little bit about the significance and treatment of boundaries in built environments. Um, born uh, on the island of Oahu, I'm keenly aware of the human touch upon the natural boundaries of our mokopuni, or island. Uh, the built environment has increasingly encroached upon the natural boundaries 
that can help define one's sense of space and belonging. Often boundaries that are designed into the built environment establish limits and eliminate the Aboriginal use of that land in every way, as you can see in you know, Waikiki. Uh, it's evident that certain Western approaches to building have historically undermined the sophisticated infrastructure developed by indigenous peoples. Here in Hawaii, we see prime examples of this in Waikiki, Ala Moana, Kaka'ako, I mean, Magic Island and Ala Moana is entirely reclaimed land. And I don't know why they use the term reclamation because they're just making new land. They're not actually reclaiming it. Um, but, uh, you know, we see where the built environment uh, ha ha has completely wiped out the natural boundaries of land and eviscerated the Aboriginal uses of those regions. So today we see the impact of a hardened environment upon our Aina with seawalls, culvert systems, roads, uh, insulated buildings that do not engage the natural resources of our islands and more. Um, I think the creation of artificial boundaries reflects a desire to control certain aspects of the environment and its indigenous culture and peoples. <laughs> um, where, where on the other hand, in most every corner of the world, native peoples have developed balanced systems that work with natural boundaries instead of against them. I think our artificial boundaries have not always impacted us in a positive manner um, as we have chosen to disrupt the natural cycle of ecosystems and, and continue to abuse pre precious resources. I, I think, you know, in terms of, you know, solutions, it would be wise to revisit indigenous approaches to land use and building practice and work with the natural boundaries of the environment um, to elicit a more sophisticated development that balances the natural and artificial, you know, the, the or organic and the inorganic. I think it's really um, telling with sea level rise uh, that our sea walls are breaking down and, and we have to become more flexible in a way that we can adapt to the changing um, uh, uh, environmental, uh, changes and, and and so it's really important i mean uh, for example hawaiians we had a uh, fish pond we 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 manipulated the shoreline areas as well but i would say that it was again a more balanced approach and it was a a, a way that did not uh destroy or completely change that that shoreline area which is always in flux uh you know it, it the fish ponds were able to to um i guess enhance the resources and and you know expound on those resources rather than eliminate them and and change change it completely so um you know that that is my answer to that question <laughs> I think it's really important to, uh, to, to cross boundaries. I think it's critical to innovation, creativity, and idea expansion. Um, you know, I like, my practice involves crossing boundaries in both materiality and concept. I, I like to use contemporary materials, tools, and equipment uh, to communicate an understanding of the world founded in my own ancestral knowledge, which is the, the Hawaiian culture, and, and which crosses generational boundaries and time. Um, I mean, I, I look to my parents uh, and I look to my former teachers uh, who have now passed, uh, and, and I look to the younger generations as well uh, to learn from. <clears throat> and you know there are certain um, I guess approaches to my work that are consistent but they are always um, I guess they're always challenged 
uh, to a certain extent. But but there is, I think, a flu, a, a, a common a commonality uh, that runs through a common thread that runs through uh, my process. And uh, the the pieces may look quite different because I, I'm not media specific. I like to use a variety of different materials. Um, and I guess I like to go big too. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, I think, I guess I like to, uh, to, to challenge myself in, in terms of remaining uh, rooted in my culture, uh, but also embracing otherworldly philosophies such as Christianity, you know. Um, I think I often construct narratives through symbols and objects that address the impact of historical events on the present day. And if I include organic elements in them, uh, they can change over time and, um, you know, metaphorically, I guess, reference the nature of culture as an evolutionary process. So, um, you know, I would say that it's really important to cross boundaries, but you, you need to do so. It, it just depends on whether it's within the culture and within the aina that you're working or outside of your culture. I would say they both have different approaches, right? Um, if, if I'm entering into someone else's land and into someone or, you know, onto someone else's island uh, or into someone else's district, uh, you know, all are quite different and, and you have to walk in respectfully. And I think that's where we're getting to like the third question. You know, I, I think, Kevin, a key factor would be to start any endeavor with an open mind and with the recognition that one culture is not better than the other. You know, there's an attitude of sharing and learning from each other that is critical to gleaning the best of all worlds. Um, I think there should be a more respectful and considered approach to moving ideas between cultures. Let's look at the values that we have in common and work from those shared values. If one's intent has the potential to harm another, then we should step back, reevaluate our motivations and figure out, you know, how, how to move forward together. I think problems occur when one culture has no respect for the other culture, especially in someone else's homeland. I mean, you, you just mentioned H1, you know, bisecting all the Ahupua, you know, throughout the entire island. So, and, I mean, if you look at those, you know, the, the interconnectedness between uh, mountain to plains to ocean to sky, that is broken. And, you know, had we been a little more attentive to those kinds of infrastructure and those kinds of systems that had been established by the indigenous people, by native Hawaiians, you know, then possibly we would not be in the situation that we are in today with seawalls breaking down, property, you know, uh, becoming uh, claimed by the sea. Uh, we would have built in a, a more considered manner, I think, or a considerate manner uh, that that would benefit us all. And 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 in terms of you know looking at a history of where we fed everybody on island, and now we're at at a point where you know we import ninety percent of our goods that's that's really very telling about where you know where we have where we are going where we have come to at this present day and um you know it i think we really need to reevaluate you know our our 
thinking and, and the way that we're going to readapt. And we're very capable of doing so. And I think that uh, it's important for us, um, you know, to, to be, it, it's us, up to us to, to find those solutions and we can find them. But we have to relinquish certain values or, or our grip on, on, I don't know if they're values even, uh, but you know the consideration of of money as as the you know all important you know base that that you know we're after. I think we have to look beyond that and 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 grasp the world in a broader sense. I guess we should adopt humility <laughs> as an important and critical value when entering uh, an environment and culture that is not yours. The Western approach has always been to exploit the natural resources of someone else's lands, to decimate the in indigenous peoples, and institute foreign political systems that favor the settler. It is this kind of thinking that creates an imbalance in the world and harms the interconnectedness of living things. There are certain Hawaiian values and universal values that I think we should be employing in our approach to the built environment and to others. I mean, to everything is interconnected. One is malama, and that's stewardship. We should be stewarding our resources and creating a built environment that can sustain itself and utilize the natural elements that make us unique. In Hawaii, it's like the trade winds, you know? We should use the trade winds instead of creating bubbles that need to be condition. Um, we need to serve, we need to, we, we, and when I say serve, we need to serve our environment and all the creatures that are our environment, including ourselves. We need to honor that, we need to protect and care for everything, because everything is interconnected. You know, I jump in my car, I have an impact on this place. I'm using gas, I'm, you know, creating potholes in the roads, et cetera. But, you know, I mean, we used to be there and, and this tendency for us to come in and claim our little piece of, of the island and then not be a, a part of the community, which we see all over Oahu especially. It's, it's disheartening, I think, you know, Kahala, look at Kahala, for example. You have all of these mansions, you know, that are, um, that are insulated, you know, that have central air systems. And well, you know, Kahala used to be pretty hot, but they're still, they're still open to trade winds. If you don't like hot weather, then don't build there, you know, find, you know, find someplace else to build. You look at those natural, uh, uh, boundaries and, and those uh, characteristics of place and location and site and, and build accordingly. Don't try to disrupt that. And, and so, um, you know, these are just my personal thoughts on, on, on the, <laughs> you know, how, how can we um, move ideas through cultures without undermining identity? I think Malama is one. Ho'ohanohano is another, which is the, uh, to honor the dignity of others. You need to conduct yourself with distinction and cultivate respectfulness. I think that uh, also is, um, you know, something that we need to practice more. A, a third uh, element is, is the notion of kako, which is um, the Hawaiian value of inclusiveness. It means all of us. It means we are in this together. Kako is very unifying when applied to language and all are taught to learn, speak, and practice the language of we. You know, it, it, it's really about doing this together. And the fourth um, and final point is service leadership. It's how do we serve others, at, you know, in terms, instead of how do I serve myself? And I think, you know, that's what, you know, you just reiterated here, but I think it's a very important aspect of life that we need to see more of. You know, we need to see 
um, people looking out and being mindful and being heartful and, and being utterly committed to serving other people. Because we're only here for a very, very brief moment in time. And um, I think I would like to leave this land having done something for someone else than having done it for myself. You know, you know we, we should look at ourselves as, you know, being um, just as important as, you know, the monk seal or, you know, a tiny palila bird, uh, you know, it, it, everything, you know, is important. And so we should be mindful of, of, of these, of, of our impact upon all these other creatures and, um, you know, plants and, and things. So, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, if we adapt into utilizing, you know, these, at least these four basic values, I think, uh, you know, we can start to change, uh, start to change the world. 